good morning uh, everyone and uh, yeah good afternoon also uh, depending where you're located uh, i'm antoine garnier i work for idsa international data space association as a project manager uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar about uh, ppt or pet so privacy preserving technologies or privacy enhancing technologies uh, however you want to call them and uh, how they contribute to make data space more trusted. Uh, the agenda for today is uh, pretty simple. Uh, we will have a four short presentation made by, uh, made by our uh, uh, preeminent speakers, uh, including, uh, uh, in that case, less preeminent, of course. Uh, by the way, uh, hello uh, to them. So Mark, Luis, uh, and uh, Francesco. Uh, we, after a brief uh, introduction of the project, uh, we will uh, describe uh, the platform and also some technologies uh, used to prevent uh, breaches or uh, data leakage, or how to detect them uh, before, how to detect them. Um, and uh, finally, we will have a, a presentation about uh, the social perspective uh, on privacy and machine learning, which are uh, uh, central uh, in this presentation today. Um, just before starting, uh, I wanted to invite you also to contribute in the chat uh, with uh, any feedback uh, you might think uh, relevant uh, for this discussion, uh, either a question or an experience. Uh, this will be very welcome. and. Uh, we will have time uh, after the presentations and during the Q&A uh, to take them and uh, discuss them if you want also. So uh, with that transition, uh, let's get started. So Andreas, if you don't mind, can you make me the, the presenter now? Thank you very much. So uh, I wanted to start from uh, something uh, where, which is well, quite well known. Uh, this is this sentence uh, from uh, Peter Novik, uh, the director of uh, research uh, at Google. Uh, nothing is very new here. You are uh, most of us aware uh, of this, uh, yeah, uh, what it's uh, meant here. Uh, what I wanted to um, really describe here is the assumption that you can see behind and that is perfectly introducing our today's discussion which is that uh, well uh, to uh, have a better algorithm you need to have more data and uh, the thing is that uh, in a lot of cases, uh, this is the very difficult part to get access to this data uh, just as uh, we in research project, uh, we are very aware of that. Uh, how many times do we end up with poor quality data actually or lack of data uh, to build our experiment? So this is uh, definitely um, a pain point. And uh, this was the starting point of the Musketeer project that, it that we will be uh, talking uh, about today. And uh, this is the difficulty that we wanted to overcome uh, using different state-of-the-art technologies and standards also, such as the uh, IDSA framework, uh, helping to bring more trust uh, in the data sharing and data space. Uh, those barriers uh, can come from very different origin. So just to give you uh, a hint, some hints about the difficulties that you, you can encounter. So this can be legal barriers uh, depending on uh, the data localization, for example, this is uh, very true for uh, GDPR, for example, regulation. Uh, this can uh, be a first uh, a barrier to, to exchange data. Uh, but this, this can be also the problem with uh, data ownership, for example. Uh, uh, for example, the data can uh, not be uh, replicable or uh, distributed. So yeah, this can be a, a problem. And obviously, this can be also the, the problem of the confidentiality. You are, uh, as a company, just not allowed uh, to uh, share uh, this data or you don't want to share this data uh, because this is too sensitive and you do not have a way to share this data without um, uh, revealing uh, some very crucial assets. 
Uh, of course, there is also the problem of personal uh, data, uh, just as uh, uh, in the healthcare sector, this is uh, very true. And actually, we have a use case on it. Uh, the, so, yeah, we encounter this uh, this kind of problem. Also, uh, the different uh, private uh, privacy policies that the partner can have and get, that can make some uh, some problem. So this is why we uh, started uh, this uh, project called Musketeer. And the, the point of Musketeer was to, to develop this uh, uh, industrial data platform. So let me explain that. The idea is really uh, to have, uh, as you can see uh, on the screen here, uh, a platform, which is here the, the Musketeer server part. But this is really an ecosystem. Uh, what I want to mean here is that uh, you have different uh, organizations that you can see uh, there uh, at the bottom part of the, of the picture that are able to communicate with this uh, uh, Musketeer server and uh, really exchange in a very uh, privacy-preserving uh, way uh, their data or uh, to be uh, more uh, accurate as we are uh, using federated learning, this is more exchanging uh, machine learning models uh, to be uh, trained locally and then uh, being assembled um, on the side of the server. And again, this is depending on the different uh, use case, the pumps, uh, as we uh, uh, de uh, describe them uh, internally, to uh, exchange data uh, with different level of uh, security. On the top of that, we also uh, are working <clears throat> on several tools such as uh, detection and mitigation of uh, adversarial attack. Uh, this will be presented by uh, Luis. Uh, the previous part, actually, uh, the platform will be uh, presented by uh, by Mark before. Uh, we are also uh, working on a, on a model to, to monetize the data set, but this is another part of the project. And uh, again, we are also um, really uh, uh, envisioning the possibility to be uh, compliant with IDSA framework. So we are assessing uh, how to do so because the, the technology that are involved here uh, are uh, very uh, state of the art. And there are some little things that have to be uh, uh, looked at uh, to, to ensure that uh, this can be compliant with IDSA uh, model and then also being compliant with other uh, ecosystem at all that are uh, themselves uh, IDSA compliant. So just a word about the use case that I mentioned already. Uh, we have one uh, on manufacturing. Uh, this is uh, about, especially uh, as it is in the uh, automotive sector, we uh, were uh, uh, working on a use case uh, about in, uh, improving, uh, increasing the welding quality of uh, uh, car doors. Uh, we made the first prototype of that uh, that has been uh, presenting, uh, presented recently. And you can find more about this story uh, with the uh, thanks to uh, the, the story that is available on our uh, website. So I'm uh, going to share that with you uh, already. Uh, with you all so you have the link uh, in the chat so yeah don't hesitate to, to go there if you want to have more uh, info about that uh, but again the challenge was uh, twofold uh, on one side obviously uh, the idea was to train machine learning model uh, to uh, improve the the quality of the of the welding so this is the uh, uh, the objective really, uh, but also to make it without disclosing uh, data, meaning that they should not uh, move actually because they are uh, trained uh, locally uh, at every uh, factory. And uh, in the same uh, sense, we have this uh, healthcare use case you know, where we are trying to improve uh, cancer diagnosis based on the medical imaging uh, management system. Uh, and uh, this is more or less the same, but with hospital, and you know that is very difficult uh, to uh, use uh, the data that are uh, produced at hospital level uh, because it involves a lot of uh, personal data. So you have to take a lot of uh, precaution if you uh, want to be sure uh, that any uh, 
you, you don't have any leakage or problem with uh, with those data. So uh, let's have a look at how the platform is working. So I will now uh, hand over to uh, Mark uh, for uh, his presentation of the platform. Then we will be talking a bit more into detail uh, about the technologies and uh, finishing on, as I said uh, before, on the social perspective about uh, those uh, elements before the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Antoine. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can, Mark. It is perfect. Great. OK. Um, so uh, my name is Mark Purcell, and I'm working for IBM Research um, out of the U European lab, which is has multiple labs, actually. One happens to be in Ireland. There's one in Zurich. There's also one in the UK. And my main background has been in HPC, uh, high performance computing. And generally speaking, from you know most of what I do is to do with the software engineering aspects of, of projects. Um, as I said, the, my main background was HPC, but in more recent years, maybe the last four or five, I've moved much more towards cloud architectures and microservices and how they are deployed on um, both public and private cloud. Um, so as Antoine has mentioned, we're going to be talking a bit now about the platform for Musketeer, which is a H2020 project, um, which is just past the midway point at this stage. And so again, it's, it's essentially building an industrial data platform for secure and privacy preserving federated machine learning. So first off, I'm going to talk just briefly about the federated learning scenario that we are looking at in Musketeer. Um, and I think the thing I'd emphasize most, again, as Antoine said a minute ago, is that we're looking at a cross organizational view. So, you know, you could have scenarios whereby federated learning takes place in a department, okay? So, you know, in, in one organization and in, in such a scenario, the trust model would would be different than a cross organization. So for example, in a cross organizational view, you, you could be talking multiple geographies. So we could have, in this case, you could have um, the person organization A who wants to build this uh, machine learning model for predictive maintenance, but knows full well that there could well be data in other organizations in other parts of the globe that could be of value to contribute to building the model. And indeed, other organizations then be able to see that this is taking place and that they could participate because they have the data. Again, I'd like to re-emphasize, as Antoine said, the data itself, there's no requirement for it to ever leave the premises of any of these individual organizations. So in this case, we could say that organization A takes on the role of the aggregator. And the aggregator in this case may share an initial model and would receive updates from various participants who would train locally on their data sets and maybe return model weights and so forth back to the aggregator, whereby the aggregator would fuse these updates from the various participants to produce a new model. Again, that new model may be recirculated for further rounds of federated learning. So that's the general scenario that we're looking, but that we look at in Musketeer. So in terms of what we wanted to build and what our goals were from, from the get-go, um, so as I said, we wanted to be across organization. And again, that has issues because it's across the globe, which effectively means all communications between parties are in fact via the internet. And that has its own security challenges. Um, again, it's like the trust policy is different in this case, right? Because if you are operating in a multi-organizational role, you don't know per se who the other organizations are. So your level of trust of the participating parties uh, might be quite low, or in fact, might be zero. Again, that's a bit different to a, an interdepartmental scenario whereby you know, it, it's quite likely you might actually have a high level of trust amongst the parties. So with all this, we certainly need some kind of authentication. And um, if we're talking about a system that can operate across organizations, we need to be able to authenticate who the different organizations to the platform. And indeed, authorization for certain activities would be different depending on your role. So for example, if you take the role of the aggregator, whereby you are fusing participant updates, 
there are different features of the platform that you will need to use versus if you were a participant, where you, all you really are doing is training on your own local data set. Another part of this, of course, is because we are talking about a system that will have to operate across the internet, we really want to limit or eliminate, is, is insofar as possible, the attack surface to any kind of um, you know, actor who may want to attack the system. And part of that, of course, will be to encrypt all communications to make it make it harder. Um, and also, we would like to have as much privacy uh, preserving features as possible, even so far as to protect the identity of, of all participating entities or parties, whereby if you are collaborating on a machine learning model, it's not actually essential that you need to know the um, identity of the aggregator or indeed the aggregator needs to know the identity of the participants. So what does this actually look like? So I'm going to go through now a, a flow of how the platform actually works, the full operations of the platform when federated learning um, is underway. But first, I'd just like to point out some of the features that we talk about, particularly in terms of security and privacy preserving. So if we look at the central part, we have it's Musketeer is hosted on the public cloud. Again, this supports multiple organizations in remote geographies who want to be able to cooperate. So what we look at here is the central cloud will host a number of microservices. And what I've depicted here are three queues, a rabbit and queue queue. And what we have is a specific queue for every participant and aggregator. Now, what this is effect effectively is a brokered system, okay? Whereby everybody has their own dedicated queue. And by dedicated, I mean, it's fully access controlled so that if you take participant A, this queue here is dedicated only to participant A and no other participant or aggregator can in fact view or even know of the existence of the queue. So it's a fully private queue dedicated only to, to the given participant. <clears throat> As I said, there are a number of microservices. I've highlighted S3 here in particular, which is an object store. So basically every public cloud has a variant of an S3 object storage, which we use for high volume transfers. Like we we often see in in um, machine learning, it's quite possible that models may in fact be quite large. Um, so it would be, you know, it 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 has transportation issues essentially. So uh, we use an object storage um, to support that. If we look at the applications themselves, so they are effectively what we're calling modeling applications, with talk, which talk to their own local data which again, there's no requirement for that data to ever leave the premises and it can be accessed via the, the local data access policies that would already be in place on any given organization. So these are effectively data applications, all three um, operate essentially as a data application, albeit the aggregator is marginally different from participants, it wouldn't have data or different types of data. <clears throat> the last thing I'd point out here are we would assume that every organization has a firewall or some kind of access policy for traffic to the internet. And again, in terms of the internet being kind of tricky when it comes to security and privacy. So what we, what we have is a system whereby all activity and all network connections are always initiated from a participant to the cloud or from the aggregator to the cloud. There are no connections required between participants or between the participant and the aggregator. So that effectively means that from a firewall rule perspective, the only rule that's required in any location for any of the parties is a rule to allow outbound traffic to connect to, um, to the cloud system, effectively to, be, to connect to a rabbit and queue queue. So there's only one, one um, one rule and one direction of, of network connectivity being initiated. As we hit that point, this is the first thing that happens in federated learning, whereby the participants will join a task. So again, they'll initiate a connection directly to their dedicated RabbitMQ queue. Again, nobody else can see that queue. So essentially, they will then wait for activity on that queue. At this point, an aggregator could decide, okay, it's time to start training and they may have an existing model which they want to share as part of the, the, the initial round of training. 
Similarly to the participants, the aggregator will make a connection to its public cloud RabbitMQ queue. Again, outbound connection only. At this point, the model would be uploaded to the cloud object store via standard S3 APIs. Um, and then a, a suite of microservices on the cloud would um, would be activated on the on the arrival of this model. So these microservices are all trusted. They're all housed on the cloud. They are not. They are um, they're you know part of the the Musketeer suite of uh, of software. So when the microservices operate, they notice that there's a new model uploaded. They know it's from a given aggregator, and they then send a message to all of the participants of of this federated machine learning task to let them know it's time to start a round of training. So these participants who have already subscribed to their RabbitMQ queues using the standard publish subscribe methodology will consume that message and the contents of that message will tell them, okay, it's time to start a round of training. And there is also a model that's available that you can pull down to start the training, um, to start with your round of training. That model will then be transported again with standard S3 APIs to each individual participant's premises. Again, the connection will be made outbound by the participants to download that model. At this point, local training can begin. And again, as we said a couple of times, this all happens on-prem locally, all local data, nothing, no, no need for any, um, any connections to any other entity, uh, no direct connections to aggregators or other participants. And the outcome of that local training is some version of a model update. Could be weights, counts, it, it depends on the algorithm. So we have a, a local update that the participant now wants to share back with the aggregator. Again, doesn't actually connect to the aggregator to send any anything back. It in fact uploads using S3 APIs back to the cloud object storage. This can happen asynchronously. We could have, have participant A operating on a HPC cluster with GPUs and we could have participant B operating on a laptop. So there's no need for these things to happen synchronously. Everything is uh, asynchronous running across the, the whole platform. Again, at arrival of, the, of each individual model update, that will trigger a microservice which will dispatch a notification to the aggregator's private queue. The aggregator will, who has already subscribed to that queue with its outbound connection will consume that message. It will then understand that one, one or more participants has uploaded updates to the model, and it can then start retrieving the model updates from the participants. At this point, the aggregator can then engage its own local fusion algorithm to take a look at these model updates and to fuse them together um, as, as, par as part of its own algorithmic suite to produce a new model. And at that point, we can start training round number two and we can go through the whole process again. I'll just talk about some of the features that I've touched on briefly through all of that. Um, we've really looked at privacy preservation and security as being probably this, the most important um, feature that we want to that we want to have. And it's not just the data. So we've mentioned multiple times that data never leaves anybody's premises, and that's certainly the case. But also from the view of what we've just seen, you, you can clearly see that the identity of any participant or aggregator is not known to anybody else who is cooperating on the machine learning task. So there are no direct connections between parties, which means nobody has to open any network ports to the internet so that people can connect. We don't need any of that. Everything is an outbound connection. So nothing needs to be a listening process on the internet. So that drastically minimizes the attack surface for any, any third party. So everything is effectively an outbound connection to a RabbitMQ queue. And again, each one of these queues is protected by RabbitMQ policies and nobody can see a queue that you're not entitled to see. The whole platform uses TLS 1.2 across all connections, both within the cloud and connections to RabbitMQ. And everything is based on open standards. All the S3 APIs are use HTTPS, 
all the RabbitMQ connections, you use AMQPS for the most part, all communications other than the model. The model is up to the individual algorithm. We don't know what exactly what that may look, may look like, depending on the algorithm, but all the messaging is all JSON, all pretty much standard. Everything in the microservices itself and in the general architecture, we've really wanted to use as much open source technology as possible. So RabbitMQ, open source, um, Kubernetes, open sources, that's what we use to trigger the, the microservice orchestrations. There, there are a number of microservices, which as we've seen in the, in, the, in the chart before, get triggered depending on what activity happens. And we use Kubernetes platform to, to help orchestrate them. Some of the microservices themselves are actually based on a functions as a service model. Um, and we use that for scalability. So it's quite good. It's sort of like Amazon Lambda. Um, very similar in that the microservices will scale on demand. They don't need to be provisioned to, um, you know, to, to the expected maximum scale. And as I've said numerous times, we use uh, S3 for object storage, which is very good for um, highly scalable for lots and lots of large models. I'm going to finish up this section by just saying that we have not only used open source technologies as much as possible, but we've been quite active in contributing to the open source community as well as part of this project. So the whole subsystem for messaging um, that you've seen, which is the operation between the private queues and the participants and aggregator has been open sourced in a repo we call <coughs> PyCloud Messenger. And we've also open sourced a non-microservice, non-cloud version of a federated learning platform that can be run locally um, on the laptop even, in fact. So it's quite good for um, becoming familiar with what with the APIs in PyCloud Messenger, albeit operating in a local scenario. And <clears throat> please feel free to reach us on the, <clears throat> on the social media links that we have uh, mentioned below. And I think that's me finished, Antoine, I can hand back. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for uh, for this presentation. Um, I think now this is uh, uh, Louis to present and uh, maybe also to to deep dive in the the technologies uh, that uh, uh, you you mentioned, or maybe more uh, to be more accurate, the, the different scenarios uh, to preserve and also to detect. Uh, potential attacks or so preserve privacy, but also to detect potential attack. Uh, Luis, uh, when you want. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Let's go to full screen. Okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm going to continue the the some with some of the ideas of the project uh, continuing the, the the work that Mark has described previously first of all let me introduce myself i'm luis muñoz gonzalez i'm a research associate in the department of computing at imperial college london and my background lies at the intersection of machine learning and cyber security more concretely uh, my research activities focus around the security of machine learning system some of the, the work that we're doing at Imperial is reflected in the, the topic that I'm explaining in this presentation today. So Antoine and Mark has given you some of the motivation and the goals that we have in, in Musketeer. I'm gonna talk mainly about, about the two main goals that I'm describing here in this, lay, in this slide. So first, I'm going to talk about privacy because one of our goals is to create machine learning models offering a wide variety of privacy preserving scenarios beyond the standard case and second is to ensure the security and robustness against the external and, and inter, internal internal threats including the security of the machine learning algorithms themselves let's start with the privacy part so as Antoine and Mark has explained to you before uh, federated machine learning is a technology that enables the creation of a shared uh, machine learning model without sharing data sets. That allows us to enable some, label, some levels of, of privacy for the participants in the machine learning task. However, in Musketeer, we consider that perhaps in some scenarios, these settings are not enough 
to provide the privacy levels that some of the participants would require. So for this, we have defined different privacy operation modes that consider a scenarios where first, data cannot leave the user's facilities, is the standard assumption. Second, data can be stored also in a trusted external cloud server, so we can do operations in a slightly different way. And third, we can use encryption of data sets and machine learning models to enhance the privacy of the learning process. So to do that, the main aspect or the main point that I want to highlight is that we leverage the use of homomorphic encryption, which is a special type of uh, asymmetric encryptions that allows to perform some calcul calculations on the encrypted domain. So that means that we don't require to decrypt the data first and that the results of those computations are encrypted as well. So let me show you an example. Imagine that we have these four participants that I'm showing in, in the picture. So each one of the participants do their local computations and they produce a different model, M1 to M4. They encrypt their models and then send these models to the aggregator in an encrypted form. The server never decrypts the, the, those models, but is capable of performing operations with encrypted domains such as Ad, uh, additions or multiplication by a scalar. So the server now is producing a mo an encrypted model M that is never decrypted, that can be sent back to the different users. And then the users add only the ones that could decrypt that model. In other words, the model remains secret for the server. You can find more information about the different operation modes in our website. So if you're interested in, interested in, in this topic, please uh, go there or reach us, uh, drop us an email, or, or feel free to contact any, any, any person in the team. Now let's move to the part related to the security of the machine learning systems, because this is an aspect that is perhaps more unknown to, to some of uh, the machine learning practitioners. And the reality is that machine learning algorithms are vulnerable and can be also the objective of attackers. And there are different ways an attacker can compromise the machine learning systems. It can be through the data collection, or it can be by exploiting the weaknesses and the blind spots of the machine learning system at test time. So depending on the type of attack, we can mainly mostly differentiate between poisoning attacks, which are attacks at training time, backdoor attacks, and evasion attacks that are produced at test time. I'm going to give you some examples now about all of these threats. In Musketeer, we aim to investigate and develop more secure federated machine learning algorithms to mitigate all these kind of threats. We also include mechanisms to detect malicious and faulty users that can cause some damage to the platform. And we also include mechanisms to detect users that could be providing data with a poor quality. But let me show you some of these attacks that can be performed against machine learning systems. And as I said before, I want to go through real examples to give you a flavor of uh, what these attacks look like. First of all, let's talk about poisoning attacks. Those attacks are performed at training time and, and are related to the process of data collection. So in many applications, the data collected to train the machine learning models cannot be trusted and we cannot curate the all data sets. So basically, machine learning models are trained with untrusted data sets. And attackers can leverage these to manipulate the behavior of the model and produce uh, errors or uh, degrade the performance of the system. So this is an example that happened to Microsoft in 2016. So Microsoft developed a chat box called Ty designed to interact with young people in Twitter. So these were the two uh, tweet, the first two tweets that Ty posted to the world. So we try to be very cool, use the kind of jargon that uh, are used by Jumpstart to engage better with them. And after a few hours working, these were the, the uh, tweets that Ty was, were, was posting. As you can imagine, the behavior of Ty was uh, completely unacceptable and Microsoft had to shut down the system. What happened here? Uh, what happened was that there were a bunch of users that started to interact with Tai in a very bad way. So, and Tai was learning from the interaction 
with all the participants, uh, with all the people that were interacting with Tai. With Tai. And Tai was not judging. So if the other behaviors behave like this, this behavior should be acceptable. So the other users start to, to, to teach Tai a very bad model of behavior. And this was a clear case of a poisoning attack. Last year, similar thing happened to Google, to Google Translator, but it was a very subtle attack. So it was more difficult to, to spot. So basically in Google Translator, if you type uh, so sad to, be, to see Hong Kong become China, and you translated that into Chinese, the translation that you get in the right for those that are capable of, uh, of reading Chinese was completely the opposite. So it was something like so happy to see Hong Kong become China. What happened here is that there were a bunch of users that provide wrong feedback to Google Translator. As you know, Google Translator allows you to provide some feedback on the, tra uh, on the translate translations that the, is, uh, is producing. So a bunch of users perform a coordinated attack to change the behavior of the, of the translator when you were typing this, this specific uh, sentence. A special case of uh, poisoning attacks is what we call backdoor or Trojan attacks. And this is similar to what happens in traditional systems, system security. So in this case, the behavior of the machine learning system is apparently normal, but the, the system can have an abnormal or an unexpected behavior for very specific well-crafted inputs chosen by the, the attacker. So I'm showing an example on the right-hand side. So imagine that we have a machine learning system to detect uh, traffic signs on the, on the road, the kind of applications that we have in an autonomous car. So in the picture on the left, we have a standard stop sign that the machine learning model recognizes correctly as a stop sign. But me as an attacker, I can introduce a backdoor in the system so that every time I put a yellow sticker on top of the stop sign, as I'm showing in the picture on the right, the machine learning model is not capable of recognizing that as a stop sign anymore. But it's saying that uh, the machine, uh, the, uh, the, the sign that I have ahead of me is a speed limit sign. So for an autonomous driving application, you can imagine the consequences of having this kind of attacks in your machine learning models. At test time, once the model, the machine learning models are deployed, they are vulnerable to evasion attacks or what is commonly referred to as in the research literature, adversarial examples. In this case, the attackers can exploit the weaknesses and the blind spots of the machine learning system to produce errors. And it's been shown that it's very easy to produce these errors. Some of the most uh, recognized uh, attacks or uh, the attacks that have more impact uh, are this one. So first of all, we have some researchers from China last year show how to fool a Tesla car just by placing three small white stickers on the road. So by doing that, the Tesla was steering into the oncoming traffic uh, uh, lane. We, and this fact can have, as you can imagine, uh, catastrophic consequences for the safety and security of this, uh, this application. On a different application domain, for example, in malware developers start to be aware of the vulnerabilities of machine learning system and uh, start developing malware that is capable of deceiving the machine learning components of antivirus systems. So for example, in 2017, there was a ransomware family called Server that was capable of deceiving the machine learning component of this uh, antivirus system. So as you can see, this is not just a research topic that we like to do for fun, but it's a real need. And this threat is going to become more and more important as machine learning systems are becoming the core of many systems and applications. In the case of federated learning, uh, obviously, as any other machine learning system, we are vulnerable to all these threats. Perhaps in the case of the attacks at test time, we are suffering from the same vulnerabilities as in the standard or the centralized machine learning settings. 
So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to focus on the case of poisoning attacks where federated learning settings uh, have a special settings for the, the attacker. And I'm going to illustrate the vulnerability of uh, federated learning to poisoning attacks with a simple example. So let's assume that we have a machine learning model that just has one parameter that we call beta. So let's imagine that we have four participants and at the one training round, so each one of the participants do their computation on their local data sets and send the estimate of the value of that parameter beta to the central server. So as you can see, uh, we have a 4, 4.7, 5, 5.3. And the server, typically using the standard federated learning settings, tries to compute an average of the parameters sent by each one of the participants. So here, if we compute the standard uh, mean, we get a value for beta of 4.5. Let me show you what happens if we have an attacker. And the attacker says that the value of that parameter beta is 100. When you compute the average in the server now, you see that the average is way much higher, is 28.5. So just by having one guy, one bad guy, trying to manipulate the model, we can have a significant change in the behavior of the machine learning model. We, this can lead to very poor performance and uh, or to, to manipulations of the, of the model in, in the, the way the attacker decides. And uh, this is a very simple example with just one parameter. So imagine what an attacker can achieve in the standard machine learning models that have millions of parameters. And the difficulties that we may have to detect attacks in those uh, settings. Also consider that we can have different attack scenarios. So we can have different set of uh, attackers trying to compromise the platform. And uh, in worst case scenarios, we can also have collusion. I mean, we can have set of attackers that pollute to manipulate the model in the same way, trying to follow the same objective. So that reinforces the, the, the power for the, for the attackers. In Musketeer, we are developing some techniques to mitigate this, uh, this effect and this, this type of attacks. We have developed an, uh, an algorithm called Adaptive Federated Averaging, at the bottom of the slide, I'm showing the, the, the link to, to our research paper where we explain the details of this uh, algorithm the, and that basically works as follows. So we compute the similarity of the models provided by each one of the participants with respect to a reference model. And once we've done that, we cluster the value of that similarity and then we try to identify groups of users that are providing similar updates and we focus on the majority of users that we assume to be benign and that allows us to discard potentially malicious users or clients of the platform that may be providing uh, faulty or poor quality data. Our technique also allows us to model the quality of the updates provided by each one of the participants. And we use these quality indicators to block uh, users that uh, could be considered as uh, malicious for the platform or that could degrade the performance of the, of the machine learning system. Just to wrap up, so let me give you the main points that, or the main takeaways that, that I think you should be taking from this presentation is that first, that the Musketeer enables to enhance the privacy of federated learning algorithms beyond the standard settings by leveraging homomorphic encryption and secure multi-party computation. The second takeaway and is that be aware that machine learning systems are vulnerable to attacks and so it's the case for federated learning uh, uh, algorithms. In Musketeer, we are working hard to provide robust machine learning algorithms capable of mitigating all of these threats. And we are also striving to provide mechanisms to quantify the quality of the information provided by each one of the, uh, of the participants in the federated learning task. This allows us to block bad, uh, malicious, faulty clients, and also to estimate the value of the data 
provided by each one of the participants in the in the federated learning task. So I think that's all on, on my side. Here are my contact details and the contact details of the project. Feel free to, to reach us for any questions that then you may have. And I think that's all on my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Luis, uh, for uh, this uh, very uh, interesting presentation. I think uh, uh, this is also a, a very good way to uh, get uh, into more details about what we're, we're doing in the in the project. Maybe now uh, just to uh, to take some uh, to have some perspective on uh, how it is perceived and uh, what is exactly the the, the social impact of uh, the, those privacy and machine uh, learning. Uh, uh, techniques. Uh, let's have uh, this uh, presentation by uh, Francesco uh, uh, Caparelli. Uh, he is from the Institute uh, Instituto Italiano per la Privacy uh, and also uh, coming uh, through uh, NGIOT, which is a, a, a project, a CSA, so a communication and a support action uh, from the H2020 uh, framework, uh, which I'd like to, to thank you, uh, to thank also uh, as uh, they help us to uh, organize this session. Uh, Francesco, the floor is yours. Thank you, good morning, everyone. Uh, and I thank you for, uh, for your precious work. For your precious work, which is precious because uh, today I'm going to talk about GDPR. Why GDPR again? Because your, your work is precious even in the compliance with the law, so with the regulation. The, the General Data Protection Regulation is a way, is a mean for Europe and for citizens to have trust in the systems, even in the most technological one, even in the ones that they not comprehend because they don't have the background, the cultural background to comprehend. The general data protection regulation is a way to enhance trust in citizens and to build trust in the usage of machine learning, federated machine learning, even IoT. We, uh, we from uh, a new generation IoT had some researches, as you may understand, um, about trust building and then user engagement. And we found out that the general data protection regulation is a way to increase, to enhance the trust in end users. But I want to highlight that end users are not just the citizen, but even in a B2B perspective, even businesses. So what Musketeer is doing right now is trying to uh, be compliant with a technological aspect to the law and uh, thus can provide to companies the possibility to be compliant with their with a very specific regulation enhancing their business optimizing their data and performing business related activities that can provide to them uh, that added value that uh, we in Europe have, we hope we will have. Why it is important to be compliant and why it is in, it increased trust for the sanctions? I mean, maybe, maybe. A company is very focused on the possibility to have a sanction. So uh, the fact that a project like Musketeer can uh, uh, encompass, can uh, evolve the framework of the usage of technology in order to be compliant with the regulation uh, can provide a mitigation of the risks of the of the sanction itself and uh, therefore it's a very precious work uh, the privacy present, uh, preserving technologies can actually um, bring a fil rouge can build a fil rouge from law to technology so from the regulator to the citizen personal data we need to understand what a personal data is for the regulation in order to understand why it's so important to enhance trust and to give us a, a social perspective in the usage of machine learning based but even in high technological projects it's an information that uh, is related to an identified or identifiable natural person that is why musketeer tried to understand how to build a path 
that can encompass and can enhance the production of models without personal information and information leaving the premises of the businesses that are involved. It's important because the regulation asks for the compliance and uh, as you may see, identifiable natural person, I mean, is a very wide, it's a very wide concept. An MIT research said that no information on the web can be anonymized, whatever. We don't want to be so tranchant. Uh, we will just say that even if an information is encrypted, if it relates to an individual and encryption can be reversed, it's still personal data. So it's not anonymized. So uh, in order to be compliant, using the Musketeer solution, it's very useful because it provides a mean or to don't have an identifiable subject or to protect it. And if you protect the data subject, the data, the data subject will trust the solution. If it's a company, if it's a user, doesn't really matter because trust is a human thing related. And so it applies to companies and to citizens. The processing of personal data, the, the, the process that uh, uh, were illustrated till now, uh, are very peculiar. And there are a lot of operation or sets of operation that encompass, that encompass personal data processing and uh, that encompass the fact that personal data are stored, are elaborated. Still, they are they are elaborated and processed in compliance because they are actually preserved by the technology, which is very important. The data controller in the musketeer case will be always the one who has the data no ownership. So the platform will will uh, uh, will be Consider as a data processor, which means that as a data processor, they um, they have to give to the data controller guarantees in order to be compliant, and that's what they are doing. That's what the project is doing. So the data processor, which is engaged to process personal data on behalf of the data controller, has to give guarantees, and Musketeer is giving them. And then there's the data subjects rights. Inside the, the framework that uh, has already been uh, described, those rights that regard citizens, that regards all of us, are preserved because uh, you have the possibility to choose to leave the data on premises and to leave the data in the ownership of the data controller. And that means that you are also compliant with data subjects rights which is very important because data subject rights is the main key to enhance data trust in end users. The possibility to access to their data, the possibility to erasure the data, the rectification, the portability, the objection, the withdrawal of consent is very important and it's felt in the community. It's felt because whoever uh, has, a, I don't wanna say a passion, <laughs> But whoever has the cultural heritage to understand how important is their data will exercise and will exercise the data, the rights, the data subjects rights. And they want to be, they want to trust this possibility. So this is another uh, huge, uh, it's another huge goal that Musketeer has reached. One of the most important things is the respect of the principle of accountability. The principle of accountability it can be respected by giving guarantees, as I already said. Guarantees in order to avoid a personal data breach. We already seen, have seen in the last presentation that there's a lot going on in the cybersecurity, in a cybersecurity perspective. So the attackers tries to um, perform their malicious actions in order uh, in order to attack the machine learning based solution. But 
having designed the musketeer project in a data protection by design perspective in a data protection by default perspective perspective give us the possibility to say that confidentiality breaches availability breaches and integrity breaches are mitigated and therefore this is uh, an optimum in the framework of the european project and in the framework of machine learning sol solutions thus because you should notify eventual data breaches to the uh, to the authority to the data protection authority which can brings to sanctions which has to be avoided and then you have to communicate to the subject data subject which is very hard which is very hard so the solution that mosquito provide is able to avoid or we can say mitigate the high risk of personal data breaches acting as a data processor acting as a data processor and giving the possibility to provide information to the controllers there's the liability issue the liability issue come in place and will come in place even more gdpr right now it's not the it's not strict to the point with artificial intelligence. GDPR has to be revised in order for, um, as Antoine said at the beginning, in order to not be a constraint in adding value in businesses. And, that, uh, and liability issues in artificial in intelligence will come and uh, will be dealt with in the future. The European Commission in the report for um, in the report said uh, that liability liability implications civil liability implications in the usage of artificial intelligence will uh, will be central in the future. So I suppose and we suppose as NJOT that liability in artificial intelligence will be one of the emerging fields in law. But even and most of all, one of the emerging fields in the trust increase in the trust enhancing uh, in the trust building because we will use artificial intelligence based uh, algorithms if we trust them and to trust them we have to understand who is accountable and therefore the liability issues come to place and it's very highlighted i don't want to steal time because it's just one minute to to noon so i don't want to 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 steal time to answer a question and thank you for your attention